topic, let's start and let's dive into what longitudinal studies are all about and what are the different theories and theorists in early years that we generally do talk about in our profession. So can somebody unmute yourself and just give me a small, you know, idea of why we should anyways carry out a whole study and, uh, and what is long? It is basically when we do observation and assessment throughout the year on a child. So we do summative, formative assessment. So this goes on for a couple of years, uh, rather than five, five years for a child or six to seven years for a child. So longitudinal study will give us the entire from the start, uh, the child's development, on how it has developed from uh, one year to two to three, how the child has developed in the whole For example, uh, area. Just having like maybe child A in your classroom and you want him to learn 10 new words today. Uh, sorry, like in a month, maybe. Okay, like maybe that's your goal. So basically, you're trying to improve his vocabulary. That is your end goal. So longitudinal study means that in that month, you have particularly just focused on that child, maybe for like maybe 10 minutes of the day or maybe for 20 minutes of the day, you have focused on that child and you have done activities in that one month just for improving vocabulary, not general activities that goes on anyways throughout the day, but these are just the activities you have done keeping your end goal in mind. So this is what a longitudinal study is. So a longitudinal study meets the gap between what a child can do and what the child should be doing at this age. And then the teachers help them achieve those milestones with longitudinal study. Now, when I say longitudinal study is only on one child, it can be very daunting. Okay, so before we even start talking about anything, you know, in early years, we have to look at what are the basic principles that we are going to follow that we are generally going to follow throughout, even throughout this session, what are the basic foundation principles that I will be you know, referring to when I'm explaining the whole longitudinal study. So we know the four basic principles that every child is unique, okay, that's number one. And keeping that in mind, we're supposed to plan activities and we're supposed to give positive relationships to the, the child, child the or between the teaching assistant and the child or between even the nursery manager and the child. There has to be positive relationships, even between the parent and the child. Even that is something that you can help them in. Then the next thing that you need to take care of is the environment. So you're supposed to give them an enabling environment. environment with the other resources that you are giving to the child. You're supposed to give them an environment that makes them want to learn. It makes them want to ask questions, it makes them want to do experiments. That is an enabling environment. Then <clears throat> if you do keep all these three things, you know, at the top priority, then definitely you can ensure that learning and development, whenever you look at, you talk about development or learning, you talk about the goals that the child should achieve at various different, you know, ages or stages that the child is of the curriculum. As we all know, there are seven areas. And when we, when, and the areas are divided into two areas, that's fine. But then when we focus on developing all the seven areas, at once, maybe through one activity or maybe throughout the day, then we make sure that we are doing holistic development. And we don't just focus on one area, but through that focusing on one area, we make sure that all the other six areas are also developing at the same theories. When we wanna talk about longitudinal study, we have to start by talking about the theories and the theorists who started this whole study to begin with. Okay, so basically longitudinal study is really nothing but the act of gathering data about the same individual. The individual for us over here, we're talking about small children repeatedly over a period of time. We have to gather the data repeatedly over a period of time. So we must make sure that the observation and the time frame, we are really, really focusing on the time frame as well. Maria Montessori. So, so I'm sure many of you are already either Montessori trained or you, you have used Maya Montessori's theories in your, um, you know, in your homeworks before. What perfect classroom should look like? If you can just tell me a little bit. Uh, different setups of uh, like literacy can be one side. Um, math can be one side. Uh, so children have the choice to choose on where they can start from. And they are not, it's a child-led uh, environment rather than adult-led when it comes to a child coming into the setting. Yes. But do you can you tell me how much of a child led like what percentage should it be a child led and what percentage should it be adult led 
So I, I think that uh, it should be more of students uh, doing the activity and uh, involved in the activity and less teachers talk and more of the students learning and talking and you know communicating with the teacher and not just sitting and listening to the teacher. Uh, Jean yes. Piget. So Jean Piget was... Um, he was also another child psychologist, but he didn't really start off that way. He, he was first into sciences and then slowly, slowly he's, he developed the theory that when we, whenever we blame children for not being able to learn something, okay, that is really not the child's fault. So he was the first person to talk a about schema is an organized pattern of thought that establishes a mental framework that represents some aspect of the world. We develop schemas for all types of items and activities, from simple items such as a chair, a car, fish, bird, or house, to complex like the chemical bonds between atoms or the seating in the House of Representatives. In short, we develop cognitive patterns for many things. We then use the schema we have developed as a Vygotsky means to compare... talks a lot about zone of proximal, proximal development. So Vygotsky, he was a theorist and he actually talked about what and why it is so important and what effects does it have when an adult collaborates with the children in the classroom and when they don't collaborate with the children in the classroom. So he, he spoke about it Skinner. in both the... Now both he terms. again is, um, was a very, very controversial theorist because he spoke a lot about how to improve children's behavior um, and also spoke about it by doing experiments you support on reward so charts in your classroom and why is and there why okay and when the child is doing something good we are asking them something and they are uh, like responding also so we are giving them a sticker and we are telling where is your picture can you put your uh, sticker on your picture so they are like so much happy to do this activity and uh, and we are doing like so many times this one in the class so every time when we are asking something because uh, I am teaching in like uh, 1.5 to 2.5 children. So they are responding very, very happily. So we, okay. have, we are used to do this. Um, uh, I actually support the reward chat if it's um, started early enough. Not um, when um, the behavioral issues has eaten deep into the child. But you know, when we start early, it helps the child to behave more um better and you know when like i had a boy in my class the behavior issue had already eaten deep so even when we started the reward chat with the boy it only worked for like three weeks although it helped the other children to behave better because they saw that um the boy always got yeah, the so reward they see other it children, only yeah. worked for a while like the behavior issue started all over again so i don't know no it didn't work very well <laughs> Yeah, it didn't. Oh, okay. He only okay, worked for so, the other children. Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so, so then uh, this is where, um, you know, this is where it shows that all these theories that are there, you know, be it Pijot, uh, Jean Piget, be it Vygotsky, be it B.F. Skinner, we need to understand that every child is unique, okay? And that some theory will work on one child and it might not work on the other and some might work here or some might work, not work over there. We need to keep room for all these things because we're early as educators, really nothing can be perfectly organized in our classrooms. You know, it is supposed to be, uh, you know, um, a very organized mess, you can say. And some things will work on others and some things might not work on others. Would you like to say something? Um, I can see your hand is raised. Yeah, hi, Mazanya. This is really great to be attending the session, first of all. So congratulations. It's very interesting. Um, what you. I just want to really pop in and say is what we've seen really work when we, because I don't really teach um, younger children, but what we do is we do a lot of workshops for younger children uh, because I teach ethics. So teaching those values, I think it also comes down to thinking outside the box in terms of not just a chart on the wall, but actually physically making that into like maybe baskets, which where, you know, you yes. have, you know, you give them colorful balls and they have specific colors that they get, get based on the values that they've learned. And then they go and put it in those boxes. So making it more physical at that age also helps rather than just a chart. So the chart concept works really well, but what we've also seen is if we turn it more physical for younger children, um, um, they're able to relate to that more and that actually speaks to a lot more children than just a small group who will put, you know, just 
thinking outside the box and not just thinking yes. of the chart as a physical chart on a wall, but thinking how else can we have that laid out for yes. the children, like maybe a carpet so where there, they can jump in and things like that. The different methods that we can carry out the study. So as I said before, guys, longitudinal study means talking about and really, really focusing on just one child at a time and focusing on any one area of development for that child, okay? So researchers and everything, whenever they carry out longitudinal study, even teachers, when they carry it out, they'll do it only on That's one child at a time. The checklist okay. method, okay? Checklist method is, uh, is, is, a very, uh, is a very quick way and a very efficient way of you to find out where the child is standing in terms of even sampling. Now, this is what I was talking about when I told you for B.F. Skinner's theory, the model that he has used, the ABC model, this is usually used in even sampling. time sampling right. method. Now, time sampling method is just exactly what it says. It is where you, you literally just bring the child in and you start recording from that time. So like, you know, every 10 minutes or every five minutes duration, you can make an observation sociogram. Now, this is a really, really interesting um, observation method because it talks a lot about the child's interaction with other children and the child's interaction in the other areas of tracker. Now, this is very interesting and I myself used it in my longitudinal study. It shows you exactly what the child is very, very interested in and where the child spends the most time in like a setting which you have to study. The last part of today's session. So you have to follow a few rules when you're carrying out the study. Your 10 golden rules I have written, or you can also call it like your key, okay? Key of things which have to be there in your longitudinal study. When you start the study,